pay should happen any second. Yeah, I think it happened, gentlemen. By golly, welcome aboard, everybody. 131st episode. That's two and a half years at least of our weekly Monday morning, 11 to noon vlog podcast called the SBAU Astro Hour, where a lot of the board members and supporters of the South Coast Longtime Telescope and Astrophysics Club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, go online, talking heads on Zoom here to discuss new discoveries in space, and NASA milestones and missions, the night sky in general. Got another great show. I consider this like a weekly one hour incredible free university astronomy course with some of the smartest minds in town. I'm, I'm probably your host. I'm your um, vice president of the club, Ron Heron. I'll let you meet the rest of the gang here in a minute. We've got a reduced group and uh, Chuck's on vacation, but we'll talk this hour about planetary nebulas, at least one. Our own sun, you know, one day is going to become one. It's going to be an unpleasant time for all of us. Moon is waxing, or at least in the phase, and another asteroid. Plus, uh, at least two comets we're going to talk about. One of them brand new, was discovered by an amateur Japanese astronomer a couple of weeks ago. We're tracking Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, and like Pinocchio's beloved Geppetto, we're going to end up inside Cetus the Whale this hour. Speaking of our very soon second full moon, also a super moon, meaning it's the closest and full uh, to the Earth, you're going to learn how it was created. Not going to believe some of the stuff you're going to learn this hour. It's a little more bulgy on the other side. And on the screen, pictured to my left on my screen is the president, beloved Jerry Wilson. Hello, Jerry. Good morning. Good morning. Pat Forgy is his <laughs> beloved wife. He takes her to everything, including the meetings. We're going to have a big meeting this Friday night. And Dr. Callis from JPL is going to talk about the lonely, dark universe. I think we're being joined by somebody, but I'll get to him at the very end. Also on the screen, ladies and gentlemen, part of our club, it's uh, my golly, Tom Whittemore, editor of the SBA newsletter. Tom is married to Maureen and worked years at Westmont College as a science instructor, had his own lab. Tim Crawford is joining us. Tim, whose real name is Tom. <laughs> right? Are you, you, a freak, Tom? You, you freaked me out. I thought when you said it's the 131st episode, I thought you meant years. Oh, God <laughs> help us. No, that's just <laughs> 52 episodes in a year, and we're at 132, is it 131? I forget. 131. 131. That's a little past the two and a half year mark, and we've missed very few shows. Missed having you on, but I know you watch all the time. I watch all the time. Tim is a staunch supporter and a member and a builder of telescopes, and I think a great participant on Tuesday nights. We're still doing the uh, workshop on Tuesday. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jerry, Jerry runs yeah. that, and Tom Totten from time to time runs it. And uh, we've got some really good members that uh, do astrophotography. And then okay. occasionally we'll have people that are making scopes, grinding mirrors. And yeah. once in a while, we'll uh, run into somebody on, on in the outside that wants to uh, some suggestions about telescopes. If they show up, they get <laughs> first, they get first, uh, first up. Okay, well, in the old days, they could show up for real at that little house across the creek at the That's museum. Right. Those days are over. It's now online, and it's 7.30, right? Yes. Yeah. SBAU.org will probably tell you how to get there. And Tom Whittemore is also a participant sometime, right, in our weekly Well, I, I, I started the workshop, and when it went to Zoom, I, I'm more of a hands-on person. Right. So I started that workshop in 2003 until uh -huh. the pandemic came. It was going pretty strong. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's been around as long as this, longer than Good this job. program has been. Tom's married to Maureen. Tim's married to Karen. And doggone, if not Bruce Murdoch, married to Bonnie, is online, longtime active member, supporter, yeah. very intelligent guy, mm -hmm. happens to be president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. And something else we always have at the beginning of these programs that gets us in a light mood is. President Jerry's forwarded silly science cartoons. They're mostly about science, and he's got them lined up. I got some comments and references ref uh, putting down here on my little yellow sheet. So you want to throw them up, and let's have some gaffes and fun stuff to talk about. There's the cat book club. <laughs> That's what they got. <laughs> I guess most of us have a cat. Uh, Crawford, do you have a cat? I do. 
All right. And Bruce, I think you your family has a cat, right? Well, we've had cats. We don't currently. I don't either. Right. It's kind of feeding machines. All right. We're on the moon. We're inside the limb. What really happened July 20th, 1969 with Apollo 11? They were being very gentlemanly. They were always also scared to death. <laughs> you go first. No, yeah. Bud, you go first. Oh, no. Come on, Neil. You go first. <laughs> Neil had the line ready, though, didn't he? I I watched it live. Did you guys all see that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. God, we're old. Not a very good picture, but I watched it live. I know. I couldn't understand either. Argon as uh, I guess, element 18 on the periodic table. And we make bad science jokes because all the good ones are gone. Okay. Don't know much about argon, the gas, but here's... Uh, it's in there. Horrible gas. Horrible gas. Well... Noble, -E. We're on stage with a far side in their final year. Research science students are required to take one semester of maniacal laughter, as you saw in the original Frankenstein movie. Let's say the lady says on stage, for example, you got uh, you just discovered how to reanimate dead tissue. Begin by keeping your diaphragm tight. The sound should originate deep and low about here. <laughs> That was uh, recaptured in uh, Young Frankenstein with Gene Wilder. Remember, I think he laughed too. Oh, oh yeah, yep. And this is your, uh, this is uh, Saint Peter or one of the angels <laughs> watching somebody. Oh, a parachutist to heaven. No, you see, this is your ripcord here. That's uh, just a loose thread, and you pulled it, sir. <laughs> well, <laughs> welcome to paradise. <laughs> Godzilla stepped on a Lego factory, and ah, we all know that if we have grandkids, don't we? <laughs> yeah. All right, here's proof that cats exist in both solid and liquid states. <laughs> I'm sure you could get one, but just like the one on the left. Wow. Back in my day, the Simpsons grandpa says, Pluto was a planet, my God. We kind of feel <laughs> the same way here. We include Pluto with everything. That's a good one. This is the Archaeopteryx, which is an uh, ancient prehistoric, of course, end of the dinosaur era as they were phasing into birds, had three fingers on each wing, held its palms facing each other, implying it was capable of air quotes and therefore sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, we had the Sarcasosaurus or something like this. Here we go. What is this cartoon from? Does anybody know? It's not Calvin. Uh, huh? Um just no, I got it off Facebook. All right. And he's telling her at the edge of the pond or the pool or the ocean. Now they go about their business, not realizing they are being tracked. And then guess what they're holding as they walk away? The two kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also being tracked. <laughs> All right. We got lots to talk about, mostly the moon, but the summer triangles up there, moon's waxing, new comet, and then plus an old comet. You might want to put the two comet stories together if it's possible, Jer. But where do we begin? Talk about space. Got a good crew, and Chuck McPartland is in Ireland with his wife, Pat. Hey. A prominent constellation right now is almost straight up. Um finding it the other day hurt my neck for several days but oh uh, yeah oh yeah this but, is an uh, old this, photo. this is a bit old picture isn't it yeah this was, is the first picture ever taken of a star and it's a vega wow. in the constellation lyra it defines magnitude zero um or did then it's um it's near the ring nebula we'll get to that in a minute but this is a uh, um taken in 1850 by Whipple and Bond, and it's called a daguerreotype. It's a type where they put, um, I believe they put on a glass slide, they put the liquid emulsion on, and then they expose it, and then very quickly process it. It's not wow. like what we know today as film. And even and this, back then, it had four spikes. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, wow. that tells you they took it with a Newtonian or some kind of a reflector. But it, there's a couple other stars in the photograph, as you can see. They're not as bright. They don't have no. spikes on them. Wow, that's amazing. Are we looking at the uh, mountain tops on the lower left? No, those are those are um, faults in the emulsion oh, on the film. Bare spots or contamination or torn emulsion or something. When was this picture taken? What year? 
1850. Okay. Wow. July 16 and 17, 1850. I have a picture of my great great grandmother taken in 1849 as a derogatype. Mm -hmm. Wow. I suppose the photographer threw a black uh, cloth over his head as he took that picture in the middle of the night. <laughs> no, I think it was dark enough at night. They didn't have a lot of street lights then. <laughs> no, they sure didn't. They well, took all those out to Bruce's house. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Vega. Vega is an interesting star. This is a picture of the Earth's rotational axis projected on the sky as a function of year. We're right um, here. Is that right? No, 2000. 2023, Jerry. <laughs> right yeah, about where that star is. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, but it's rounded. It's rounded to the new, nearest 200, 200 years or 2000 years. <laughs> This is, um, yeah, this is just the year zero. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is where we are today. Um, Polaris is within a degree of being on our true rotational north axis. And as it goes around, it takes 25,000 years to um, go all the way around. And... Uh, oh, I didn't know that. And yes. it takes where, somewhere... Oh, this is... This is Vega down here, which will, it's going to not, it's going to be our North Star someday, about 14,000 years from now. <laughs> but but uh, it's not as close to being on the actual axis as, as Polaris is right now. So I missed it. Polaris is the red one in the middle. Polaris no. is this. Oh, it's at the top. This one at the end of the Little Dipper. <laughs> oh, it's the Little Dipper. I thought it looked a little funny for the Big Dipper. <laughs> hmm. yeah it's upside down so we're not zeroing in on the summer triangle in this photograph There's no nothing. no this is not a summer triangle photo okay gotcha this has two coordinate systems on it which makes it a little funky to try and figure it out this is the uh, um, right ascension blue lines the right ascension in today's epoch and call it and these blue circles are the declination Huh. So um, this one is concentric with the, the circle that our polar axis makes as, as the Earth uh, nutates. It's like a spinning top, and it very slowly precesses, not nutates, but precesses. It wobbles. Yeah, wobbles. That's another word. That's a colloquial word for precession. Well, actually, wobble is a, a, a wiggly waggly thing. Precession is a <laughs> nicely described uh, circle. Yeah. But none of that process has to do with reversing the poles? No. No, this has nothing to do with the magnetic field. Hey, got it. That's a, that's a separate issue. Wow. Now, in the sky, in our sky, this is 9 o'clock at night, August 20th, today's the 20th, so this is tomorrow night. But stars don't move very much, so it'll be the same tomorrow night. Um, this is Vega here, which is an easy star to find. It's almost directly overhead. This is um, the constellation of Lyra, which is a nice little trapezoid. It's easy to see. And right here, halfway between these two stars, is the Ring Nebula, M57. It's a planetary nebula. Mm. Mm. It's it's more near. Uh, I can't read the name of that. It's it's more kind of a third, not quite a half, Jerry, between those two stars. Okay. Well, well that's yeah. Half. The actual thing is right at the long finger tip is where they have a little red circle on this planetary diagram. So it's very slightly toward Sheliac, away from. Okay. Tom, do you know the name of that star, Sula? Sula Fat. Sula Fat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I can't. I couldn't. I can see it, but I can't. No, I can't see it. <laughs> no, it's pretty faint. There you it's go. It's a real small red circle there. Yeah, there you can read it. Sheliak and Sula Fat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. so this is a this is a the same constellation of Lyra with Vega drawn on a photograph of the night sky. So it's 
And it is about this easy to pick out. It, it's uh, nice. So this is the, M, the Ring Nebula M57 in Lyra. And this is a multi-spectral uh, shot. It's taken with the, it's, a, it's the, from the James Webb Space Telescope mm -hmm. in infrared light. According to your notes, they once thought it was a sphere, but it really is a ring. We're looking on flat. That's, there's, it, it's speculation, but yeah, they're, that's the consensus now. They argue about it. It also, I've seen where some people suspect that it might be a tube. Yeah, yeah. That's, I've heard it's like looking down a, a tube of pasta. Mm -hmm. a tube. Well, how long would the Something tube be? just pointed right at us. But you can see the the expect the uh, um, effects of the sudden sloughing off of the material. It's not really well. It is an explosion, but it's not a nova. And this yeah. star right here is fifteenth, uh, fourteenth, or fifteenth magnitude, and it is the white dwarf that's left over after it blew off all these outer layers. And this is what our solar system will go through in a few billion years, right? Yeah, somewhere around five. Five billion? Yeah. Are, are the colored spikes, the fuzz around the edge, is that just light, lighting effects like your four points of the star picture, or is that real matter that's... No, no, this is all they're all real matter. Around some stars, you can see there are six spikes, a real bright source, but none of that is this stuff. The, the central star, the white dwarf, is not bright enough to show those six spikes. That's from the structure of the James Webb t Telescope. This, this line across here, and then these six spikes there. That's and, a and Jerry, I, I might add that that central star in most observational telescopes, is you can't see it. Yeah, it, I've seen it. My vi yeah, visually <laughs> you can't see it. In our little scope we use for outreach, you can't see it. No. A six inch telescope under very dark condition. A uh, person with good eyes can see 13th magnitude, which is not enough to see this star. Interesting. Well, if we can't yeah. see the star, gentlemen, what are the other stars that are in there in that blue part? Those are also faint stars, but they're not related to this nebula. They're just, you're looking through a thin veil of uh, material. Oh, I see. Stars oh, behind, behind it. It's or behind in front it. of it. Got it. These are in front of it, that right there. So there's a lot of stars in front. Well, now a white dwarf can be about the size of what, Manhattan, but have the uh, the density of the sun? Yes, it can be, it's very dense. The it's size small. of a city. I think it's more like the size of the earth. Oh, is it? Okay. I guess it's neutron stars that get down. Neutron to stars, the yeah, that's the one that's the size of a city. <laughs> right, right. So anyway. Right. This I, is from the ultimate telescope, and this is from my telescope during an outreach last yeah. Thursday night. Mm -hmm. And this is, and you can just pick out the star here. Now, this yeah. is a two-minute exposure where every 15 seconds or so, it takes a picture and then it stacks it to bring out darker things. The stars here are not really um, well-defined or well-focused. The seeing was was fairly poor at that time, and the stars wiggle around a little bit. But this is um, this is a nice scope. I forget the name of it, but it's. Um, it, I think it's, it's called the EV scope. Yeah, something like that. I own one, and I don't remember the name of it. But <laughs> I got it for outreach because you just set it down. I'm getting. At my age, it's getting harder to carry all the telescopes and mounts and counterweights out. So here, this here. one only weighs, only weighs 20 pounds. You is, put it it down. Your, is it set up it's, in your backyard observatory? I can set it up anywhere. Oh, but it's not back there and, uh, right now. But you just put the tripod down, level it. Then you put the scope on the mount and you go to your iPad, open the app, and you connect with it um, over the internet, over its own internet. It becomes a hot hotspot, local hotspot. And um, then it you tell it what you want to go see, and it figures out where it is, where it's pointing. It does a lot of plate solve, which means it just takes a random look at star fields 
And then it matches those star fields to star maps to tell where it's looking. And it gets oriented and then it goes to the object you picked to go to. And you have them pre-listed in the app, things that are up that at that time. And so you, you define the visible sky or it defines the visible sky. So you don't tell it to go somewhere. It has to look through the earth to see, which uh, in an outreach would be very embarrassing. Well, on this is, this is that scope that I told you. It's only about four and a half inches uh, wide and about three, three, three and a half feet long. And, you know, Jerry was literally sitting in a, in a chair and showing all the guests this while we were struggling to see anything. He was getting color images like this with the central the 15th magnitude central star. It was just incredible. Well, it's too bad you don't have a picture of it. Oh, well. Oh, picture of the scope. We can uh, get, get one. <laughs> I can't imagine one that small. They're all barrels these days. Well, yeah. well this is because the it's about a four and a quarter, I think. And mirror and it has no secondary it has a camera suspended on a, a spider up there so that's where you get the diffraction yeah, okay. yeah. which is starting to show up in some stars but so, so uh, at the prime it's, focus Hunter. yeah it's at the prime focus you can get one with an eyepiece because people like to look through eyepieces people come up to my scope and they start looking for the eyepiece and i said there's no <laughs> eyepiece and so they walk away but um the eyepiece the version of the eyepiece version of the scope that has an eyepiece it's not a real eyepiece it's just a display screen that projects the image oh <laughs> so there's no optical eyepiece but it gives people the illusion of looking through an eyepiece it's like some of the new uh, uh dlsr cameras yeah i can't imagine today's modern professional astronomers hold up in those big huge uh, yeah, observatories looking through a damn lens. They're all looking at screens, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Yeah. The age of optical being in an observatory, famous pictures of Edwin Hubble sitting in the middle of the night uh, on Mount Wilson looking through a telescope. Must be very cold. <laughs> my, my wife made the comment, though, that when I, I was telling her, boy, I want one of these things. And she was saying, you know, I don't know. When you go to star parties, a lot of the people out there, they want to look through an eyepiece. They want yeah. to look and, and, and see. But you don't get color unless, you're, unless you have really a lot of magnification. I mean, uh, a lot of light. Yeah. yeah. And but you have to be on a great on the telescope. What would you say, Bruce? Repeat that. So they also want to grab onto the telescope. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and that gets it off track, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It can. Okay, let's move on to the newly discovered comet Nishimura. There it is. This is a this is a chart showing it's moving very rapidly through our skies here. This is from August 22. We're now here at August 28. So it's moved over a whole constellation from Gemini to Cancer. Um, it's going to move down toward Virgo. And this is the um, oh, this, I see. It's a map of Cancer, <laughs> and it's it's in it's in here, just coming in from Castor and Pollux. It's just coming down here, mm -hmm. and um, this this is to show you when it is. This is um, yeah. uh, five a.m. just before sunrise. <laughs> Oh, okay. So that's when to look for it. This is the asteroid Juno down here on my planetarium software. Can you go back to the previous picture? Is it going to plunge below the horizon? Um, Where well, the yes. Australians can see it, but we won't be able to? No, it'll interfere with the sun. Right. It'll oh, it'll go into the, the oh, daytime. I Okay, it's coming in toward the sun, actually. Yeah, these are not southern constellations. Okay, got gotcha. you. Virgo. Hmm. Interesting. I think the sun is, is in Leo right now. We're about to go into uh, Virgo. Yeah, the sun is kind of near Denebola. Yeah, so this is very, so it's going to 
mid-September, it's going to pass by the sun. Mm -hmm. So it really won't be in our evening sky. It's mostly early morning. Not for a while. I, I, I'd have to look at an ephemeris. Ephemeris. This I found over the weekend. Someone posted it on Facebook. Oh, wow. It's quite dramatic. Quite an excellent picture. Boy, it really, really is. Yeah. The size of the scope wasn't mentioned, or at least I don't recall it. But it's the uh, Utah Desert Remote Observatories. Is it passing? Uh, you, uh, you're, the rest of you people's, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 night sky. But when I look out at like four in the morning, all I see is overcast. That's, <laughs> yeah. just, that's the curse of living here. Yeah. Curse? It's got to be great. Would you rather be in Texas where it's 110? No, I, but no, we're oh, we're oh, thankful boy. for the temperature. Exactly. <laughs> I see Castor and Pollock's come up in the northeast around four in the morning, roughly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's close to the beehive? Yes. Plus? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's in Cancer. Mm hmm. Right in the middle of Cancer. Wow. <clears throat> one of the times that we are at the gun club, um, I forgot who, with whom I was speaking, but uh, there was this bunch of stars near the horizon, near the Southern horizon, I guess. We finally figured it out it was a beehive cluster. And it's big. Oh. You can see it naked eye yeah. if the sky is dark. Oh, yeah. It is a big cluster. We talked about that. Uh, Jerry, if it's possible uh, for you to move ahead and we do the other comment, you have it at the end of your talking points. Uh, 103P, Hartley. Hartley 2, is that possible? And then we'll just concentrate on comments here. Go back and pick up all these are previews of coming attractions. There is the moon. Oh, we're going to talk a lot about the moon this hour. I got a car parking that's brightening me up. Uh huh. Yeah. Boy, this we is cover hardly. a lot. Did you have pictures of that other comet? Um, let me just jump ahead here. It's. Um, Passing through the open star cluster M34. Yeah, that's the beehive cluster. Oh, that's 44. Beehive's 44, Jerry. 34 oh, is a nice 34. open. Cluster. Yeah, 34 is up uh, as polar. That's right. In Perseus. Perseus. Yes, yeah. that's right. It's it wide open, too. It's probably a colander object. It says yeah. short period comet, magnitude so, five and a half. Yeah, this is, this is August 30, mm -hmm. 2 a.m., and right here in the middle is M34. Yeah. And that's nice binocular thing. And so this is. And uh, so and then so in this region, it's passing right through the find M34 and you have the comet Hartley. Now, Hartley is a 6.3 periodic year periodic comet. Right now, it's around seventh magnitude, which is just a little beyond anything you could hope to see with a human eye unless you happen to be standing on the tippy top of Mauna Kea. But six and a half years, 6.3 years is its yeah. total orbit time? It's a short orbit comet. Well, it doesn't have time to go back out to the Oort cloud or even the Kuiper belt oh, no. with that no. kind of a schedule. No. So where does it come from? The asteroid belt? Um, I don't know where to. its home is. I mean, considering right. we take a year, uh, Mars takes what two and a half years, right? Years? Jupiter 12. Okay, so six so, and a half, um, between okay. uh, Mars and Jupiter, apparently. That's where the asteroid belt is located. Mm -hmm. Yeah, U UFO belt. <laughs> Maybe it's why we don't see a tail, that there's no moisture on this. No. Sucker, it's an asteroid. It's not a comet, but it's going in around the this sun. This is a photograph. This is a photograph of Hartley. Okay. Uh, several the, years ago, near the double cluster. Okay. okay. Matter of fact, this was taken in October of 2010. Aha. Uh -huh. So that's is the only the, uh, bluish green thing in that picture. Yeah, this is the comet here. Okay. So that's about two periods ago. Yeah. Yep. No tail. No tail in this picture. But we well, the comet only has a six-year orbital period. <clears throat> it's gone around the sun enough times that probably all the volatile stuff has been driven off. Yeah, good observation. 
but we see it every six and a half years or so. We must. Yes. We've seen it, what, three times since 2000? <laughs> now, this is a close-up shot of Comet Hartley. I'll be damned. How'd we get that? We, um, we sent something out of NASA yeah. mission. Yeah. Oh, I didn't mark down what the satellite was. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we have a lot of photographs of it. It's the one that looks like two big boulders with a, a stretch band of, of rubble between them. It's currently at magnitude 12. It's expected to get to magnitude 7 by mid-October. And then it'll swing around the other side of the sun? Yes. And then it, well, that's as close as it's, it's that's its most, for us, the beneficial observation point. Um, the uh, comet is, at, because it has a short period, it's regularly observed, and it's very predictable. So in this case, estimating that it's going to be about magnitude seven is probably fairly accurate. But the other comet, Nishimura, that's like Oumuamua. It's, it's in a hyperbolic orbit now, and it's coming from deep space, and it's going to go around the sun, and then we're never going to see it again. Because of the length of time. It will come back, but it'll be, what, thousands of years? No, it will never come back. And yet it came from our solar system. Not another no, solar didn't. stellar system. No. Huh. Well, I'm just wondering why they don't just call this one of the many asteroids that pass us. If they pass us, uh, that doesn't make them a comet. You know, they all kinds of, we have these near misses, you know, sometimes they go between the moon and the earth. The, yeah. What's the, the only difference? difference? Remember, the only difference between an asteroid and a comet is that the comet has volatile materials, like you see here on Hartley that gets boiled off little volcanoes, heats up by the sun, and it spits out all this crap. When it runs out of volatiles, then it becomes an asteroid. The volatiles is mostly water. Mostly water, CO2, uh, uh, methane, carbon monoxide, all sorts of crap. Anything that has a boiling point or a sublimation point that's lower than the temperature of the surface of the, of the object. Well, does science know why the asteroids don't have any of that stuff, but way out in the Oort cloud, they do? They used, well, first of all, the Oort cloud's way out. It's very cold. So the volatile material hasn't boiled off yet. Oh, that's here, what that The asteroids have all pretty much lost it. But if you take an asteroid out of the asteroid belt, because it's, it's, it's come to equilibrium at that temperature out there, if you move up much closer, all of a sudden, it's going to spit out a lot of stuff that didn't boil off before because it wasn't hot enough. And that very stuff, they say, is where we got our oceans. There's still, as far as I know, there's still um, uncertainty about exactly where we got our oceans. You can measure the ratio of uh, isotopes of water, and you can define the source of it. And there's no single source that matches our oceans, our water here on Earth. So it's most likely a combination of things, minerals and water that was there when the Earth first formed and water that's hit it from um, <clears throat> comets. That's all the heavy elements that went to the middle of the Earth, your lead, your gold. Not all of them. We'll get to that. Okay. But yeah. Not this program, but a future show. No, no, later on today. Oh, today. Oh, okay. Comets are us. Thank you. Uh, now you're going to have to go back and pick up where you left off, which would be Saturn in opposition or what, yeah. asteroid 8 flora? Speaking of asteroids, maybe you could stop there on your way back since we're talking about them. Let's see. What have we got here? 8 flora reaching This opposition. is Saturn. Yeah, this is, we're looking at Saturn now. All right, reaching opposition. It's inside. So we're looking at the water bearer. Uh huh. Aquarius. This is the start of the age. Of yeah, I wonder what happened to the age of Aquarius. Boy, it wore off on me. Thought yeah. it was supposed to be world peace and everything. Started. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is the southern star Fomalo, and you can tell we're looking deep in the south below the equator because the borders of the constellations are curved this way. This is Aquarius. Saturn is in Aquarius. The Helix Nebula is right here. And uh, 
other interesting stuff. Oh, Neptune is over here. That's right. I knew there was something else. I, I can't remember the star hop to uh, to the to Helix, but uh, it, it's an interesting star hop. But when you get when you do see it, because it's right in, you, you can I can see Capricorn is to the right here. Yeah, mm -hmm. the there's M thirty underneath it. Yeah, and you you'll uh, Jerry's going to talk about it. So uh, Jupiter's nowhere around in this photograph. No, Jupiter's no. up at seven. Oh, you can find Jupiter uh, later. Come, probably comes up later. The moon is down here on this day on the 30th. 11, 11, 30, Tim. Yeah, but uh, there you go. <clears throat> Saturn is um, surrounded by on, moons on the 26th. Well, that was two days ago. I got the date wrong. So you can't look forward to this, but uh, this shows the visible in a small telescope, the visible of uh, moons of Saturn. Huh, dang. Well, it's not last year. night. Well, what do you Saturn. define as a small telescope? What's that? What do you define as a small telescope? Well, in a five inch refractor, you obviously can see Titan. On a really good night, you can pick out these other ones, but they're very faint, right. know, very easy to confuse with background stars. Yeah, I easily so, pulled Titan last night, Jerry. Um, oh, about 8 30, 9 o'clock, at, yeah. at 92 millimeter. So, at our last, yeah, okay, you're a little higher on the hill than we are when we do outreach. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> last she, Thursday, Charles Schuler had his 20-inch Dobsonian out. Uh, that's a larger small telescope. Definitely <laughs> visible in those. Except we sort of got fogged out slowly. Right. I started turning hazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Charles, my, Charles said it was like a Charles was said it was like a was like it didn't show anything after a while. Isn't NASA planning to visit Titan in a year or two? Titan. Um, there, there is talk of a um, a um, helicopter or a blimp of some type, probably a helicopter pro to probe uh, Titan. But the mission, to my knowledge, has not been defined yet. There's Jerry, still, still we, writing we, proposals. Hey, Jerry, we had a guy that came to our our club. To uh, he's he's gone now. He's he passed away, but he he was really into blimps. And uh, he came out to a couple of star parties. He was going to. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. And he mm -hmm. was going to work with a guy with uh, NASA on on a on a uh, a balloon that would go yeah. over the surface of, of Titan and map it. Yeah. So, what was his name? Uh, Justin Nat or something like that, wasn't it? I yeah. can't remember. Yeah, he was English. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was a guest on my show, my radio show, for a couple of times. He yeah. Went up in a balloon, and he had an accident when he came down. Right, it rolled and died as a result of that. Julian, I think it's, Jerry, I think his last name was Not. Yeah, Not, Julian. That's right. That's Julian right. Not. Julian K N O T T. Wow. Yeah, Julian. That was his name. Julian. Rather Knott. pretty. Julian, Worldwide expert on 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 dirigibles or not dirigibles, but yeah, yep. yeah. balloons, balloons. Mm -hmm. Wow. He and actually he, helped to design the the modern blimp. Did he really? Yeah. God, I can't believe I had him in my studio for an hour. Oh, he was really nice. I used to see him hiking now and then. Julian, not, I think it's K N O T T. Yeah. Too bad we didn't get him in the club, or he could have. He was in the club, I thought. Oh, yeah, he he came to many meetings. I remember. Yeah. I remember. Oh, he did. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, he's really nice guess, guy. Really nice. Predates, guy. He predates you uh, at meetings, Ron. Oh, okay. Just, just like uh, who's the gentleman up at uh, Berkeley? Um, Alex Filipenko. Filipenko. Yeah. yeah, that's right, Filipenko. He date he predates all of us in the club. Can't get him <laughs> to come back though. You think he'd want to come back to his old alma mater just to speak? Yeah. Uh, I even, a bit. No. Uh huh. So anyway, this is that we're moving on to uh, a, a, an asteroid, a genuine asteroid. Eight flora. This is its orbit here. 
This is the orbit of Mars. Mm -hmm. So it's in the belt between Jupiter and Mars, but it's not one of the Trojans um, that is in a synchronous orbit, one of the Lagrange points for Jupiter. So this one is orbiting in here. It is the, um, let's see, I get that bigger. It is number eight there. This is the size um, of our each of the each of the top ten asteroids compared to the Earth's moon. Oh, number number eight is Flora. I mean, yeah, number eight is Flora right here. Number one is Ceres, of course, and uh, two is Pallas, Pallas. Three is Juno. Four is Vesta. Now, these were the order in which they were given names. Um, five is Astrea. Six is Hebe. You've had the Hebes before. <laughs> Step seven is Iris. Eight is Flora. Nine is Metis. And ten is Hygieia. So this time, you get to look at um, number eight. And number eight, Flora. Oops. Eight uh, Flora. Way. This this is the uh, Helix Nebula. Where these are coming together. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> yeah. What's its M number? Does anyone remember? Uh, not an SCA. Oh, that's right. Yeah, NGC seventy two ninety three. That's why I can't remember yeah, it. NGC. Mm -hmm. Right. So anyway, um, whoops. Uh, oh no, where where was it that we had the Helix Nebula on there? So, there it is. There's the Helix Nebula mm -hmm. next to the moon. Oh, yeah. And the Helix Nebula is right here. The moon is over here, and the moon is half a degree uh, in diameter. Mm -hmm. And eight palas is three degrees, so it's six moon diameters from the Helix Nebula. So it's right around in here, and that is a, a star-hopping challenge to do for the 30th, is to go locate the Helix Nebula, which is trivial for my EV scope, because I just point to it. <laughs> But for the star hoppers, they're looking at the sky and they work out that Tim is the champ of star hopping. That's a, uh, that's a tough one. Helix yeah. is a tough one because I use that left star on, on Capricorn on the bikini. And somehow I, I triangulate with that other star over to the left. I can't see the name of it right there. And so you, you can use a shallow triangle. Scat. Scat. Yes. And then, and, uh, and then Nash, Nashira or the Den Denim Algidi. Then yeah. the, uh, and then you create like a little shallow triangle. It's, it's a tough star hop. Well, did I yeah. understand you to say, Jerry, that the helix was three degrees across? No, no. The helix is only a few minutes of an arc across. Oh, the, wow. uh, the, the, the eight flora is not marked on here, but it's 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 three degrees, which is six moons. If you stack, a, remember the moon. Um, which is on this scale. Whoops, now I changed the scale. Dang. Okay, <laughs> there's the moon. Right, half a degree. So right now it's about two hands. So you want to move, so one degree is four hands. Okay. So you want to move one, two, three, four. That's one degree. Now you want to move that again. So this is two degrees. This is three degrees. So right there where the hand is, that's where um, eight oh. flora is right around in there. You can also, and Tim's brain is probably telling him it's about 40% of the way between Scat and Deneb al -Gebi. Al -Gebi. Yep. yep. And according to your earlier map showing the orbits, it's in the asteroid belt pretty much, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's in a nearly circular orbit, slightly elliptical. That's, that's just astounding to me that they'd call something like that a comet. 
No, it's not a comet. This is this is an asteroid. Flora. Oh, we're still we're we're out of Eight the comet. Flora. That's true. You're right. Yeah. This is an asteroid, but it's going to occult something. You think? No. Not, well, not occulting. It probably does, but that's Chuck's uh, bailiwick. You know, your comparisons while ago with the moon was kind of astounding because uh, there are some little mini planets, dwarf planets, that are smaller than our satellite. Look at that. These are all smaller than our satellite. I know that. That's crazy. The way they base it on whether it orbits something else, not the size of the orbit, the orb itself, the sphere. If the moon, if the moon were not connected to the Earth, it would be a, it would be a dwarf planet. Definitely, it could be a regular planet. Would. I think it's bigger than Mercury, isn't it? No, it's uh, not bigger than Mercury. Okay, no. thought it was thousand kilometers. Well, that's, but that anyway, the helix is another planetary nebula. There's the white dwarf at the center that is the ash of the explosion, which blew all this material out. Now, this material doesn't contain a lot of heavy metals. This worked up to heavy material. This one went up to some, um, like the sun is going to, up to um, something short of iron or maybe up to iron, and then it, that's all that it generated. It didn't generate any heavier elements. Looks like it has a lot of sodium in it. How do you know that? Because it's yellow. Yeah, he's going on the color. Now, you have to be careful about that in, these, in the images because basically images are all false color. Um, some of them try to be true to nature, just bringing up the intensity. But I think this is a combination of, of different images taken in different wavelengths by different satellites. This what has is, this this image is um, the the red and the green and red is from the Spitzer Space Telescope, so it's infrared. The original light from the Hubble is orange and blue. Uh, ultraviolet from NASA's Galaxy Evolution Explorer is the cyan color. And Chandra's X-rays appear as white. Hmm. So this is a this is a hybrid image, processed to look this way. Well, so, Mr. President, did any of these nebulae that we're seeing happen during recorded history of man? Did we did we see any of these? That's a good level? question. Um, it, first of all, you have to define the recorded history of man. Well, Does that it, include? Chipping away at rocks and and uh, painting things on the inside ceiling of tombs. That's uh, true, but it, didn't the Bible uh, or maybe the New Testament say that the birth of Jesus, the year zero, was that was the star that led the three men, a lot wise men? Turns out that was not a star in the heaven; it was an astrological star. Oh, it wasn't a. Hypernova or supernova? I got you. No, it wasn't a real. You couldn't look up in the sky and see that star. The, but I, um, I remember reading about something in China that they actually saw, and it was so bright you could see it during the daytime. And now we see it as one that, of these. That's um, the um, M1. M1. Thank you. That's, M1. Yeah, that was M1. Would it look like this if we blew it up, if we saw it, M1? Um, well, we see M1 all the time. It doesn't look quite like this. But M1 is not a planetary nebula in the same sense this is. M1 was a um, nova explosion. Well, I thought that's what this was. No, this is no. not a nova. This is a, a little below a nova. This is like our sun. Our sun doesn't have enough mass to go nova. Oh, I see. It just blows out its outer layers. Yeah. Well, this is a planetary this yes. is a planetary. Oh, okay. This what happens is that it it burns. Right now, our sun is burning hydrogen. Pretty soon, it'll run out of hydrogen, and then the the force pushing out, which is the energy created by fusing hydrogen to helium, that force pushing out will stop, and so then gravity will get to start contracting the star again, <clears throat> and um, then it will get hotter inside, and then it'll start burning helium. And it progressively will burn other things, each time shrinking a little bit. Eventually, it will burn the last piece of fuel it has, which is iron or pre-iron. I guess it's iron. And then um, that won't burn very long. And then when iron stops burning, 
there's nothing else that we, that can fuse with that mass. So then the star will simply start contracting. It'll shrink, and there's nothing to oppose its shrinking, and it will it will implode so quickly that it will basically bounce off itself. It'll spring back and throw all this material off. For some reason, I thought it was because iron is so damn heavy. It suddenly got to the heaviest element. And... Well, that's how it gets to the core of the Earth. It's one of the heavier elements that's there in, in a high proportion. But iron, it, it's the way iron burns. When you fuse other elements below iron, you get energy out of the fusion. When you burn iron, it takes energy to make the, energy, the iron fuse. You don't get energy from it. So it stops. the star stops producing energy from fusion. How do we get those higher elements on the table above? Supernovas. What? Super, the supernovas. Super yeah, yeah. During the explosion, they're created? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the they get created in uh, hundreds of microseconds. Yeah. <clears throat> Lord. See, the, 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 the elements below iron are sort of um, in a crock pot. You know, they're slow cookers. And the... Uh, <laughs> the uh, Stuff above iron is all at once. It's it's an explosion. But maybe half a dozen of them pretty much dominate the universe, right? Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, of course. Hydrogen is the most common. Right. And he and you go through the table, they go down in proportion. Wow. Yeah, I always have to there was I always have to ask called... I always have to ask oh, yeah. the, the sequence. And it's in, it starts at hydrogen and ends in iron. Yeah. <laughs> And everything above that, including uranium, is kind of an anomaly created after so, the fact. <laughs> yeah, it's created in an explosion. It's like that movie, um, everything, everywhere, all at once. Ah. <laughs> so that's a nova. But some of those, some of those newer ones with strange names like Californium, I think we create, don't we, in the lab? Yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> that, yeah, they have they, a lifetime that's measured in fractions of a second. Or actually, fractions of a millisecond time sometimes. Well, then, what good are they? I mean, we can we get any qualities about them? What they would be like? Well, would they be we, a gas? We, we generate a lot of papers about them, and, uh, <laughs> and now, the are in carbon, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, and then iron. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. what those are created in a supernova, also, but like. Uh, Bruce points out they don't last very long. They're not that stable. They break up automatically. They, they, just they fall it's apart funny. into other elements. Yeah. Can I just interject something real quick? I'm sorry if you hear this, uh, the texting here in the background here, but, uh, you know, uh, Chuck and, and Pat are texting everybody from Ireland right now. They say to say hello to everybody. Oh. oh. Hi, Chuck. Hi, Pat. <laughs> I think they found me a Galway girl in Galway, Ireland. I sent them off with a little challenge, a mission. Great. Did you get Did you get those images, Jerry, or no? What image? Oh, I don't know. I haven't looked yet. Okay. Would so, it be, <clears throat> would it be safe come, to say? Would it be safe to say it's about seven p.m. there, six or seven in Ireland? They're eight. Uh, they're um, eight, eight hours. hours. We are. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Fantastic. Okay, I'm sorry. Back to uh, Uranus. It's almost eight o'clock there. Is this my it's anus about, or Uranus? I think it's about five a.m. there. Oh, no. I went the wrong way, didn't I? Yeah. No, 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 no. That's no. what? It's eight o'clock. It's, it's okay. three, three or four hours past uh, the East Coast, which is three hours from us. So do the math. It's six or seven hours. Okay. We um we did business with a company in England called Stantel, which made a uh, an infrared device and all of our communication with them at this time you know this was like 30 years ago was uh via email because when they were awake we were asleep yeah and vice versa <laughs> so this is a quickie our one of our last topics today Rings. due to time this shows um um uranus as um is this uranus or neptune i think it's uranus it's the one on its side, right? That's yeah. tumbling strangely. Oops, whoops, whoops. Yeah, here this. This was taken by Voyager in 1986, the one on the left, 
And okay. then this shows modern capability with the James Webb telescope um, here in 2023. And uh, it shows many more features. It shows the polar cap, ring, clouds. Huh. So Voyager couldn't get the rings, couldn't picture that. I don't think they discovered those at that time. But tells us pretty much that universally, probably most of the gas giants out there have rings because they That's all okay. want to. Well, so with space, you've got a lot of debris, it's going to form a ring. Yeah. This is Uranus ring, and the streaks there are the stars in the background because as the um, probe went by, it took pictures of the ring. So it did. we did know about the ring from that, from Voyager. But they think it was knocked on its side by a passing other planet. It was a collision, yeah. A collision. Yeah. Let me just cover a two points real quick here. First of all, oh. this is the, this is a, an image of the full moon, not an image of this month's full moon, but it shows very nice ray systems, which we can discuss next time. Very pretty picture. This is um, this is an explanation of why the moon looks big on the horizon when it comes up, and why it looks smaller when it's directly overhead. It's because a trick of our perspective is that things overhead are very close. And as you can see by this picture of these cumulus clouds after a rainstorm. So right, right overhead, it's, the cloud is very close. Very far away, uh, clouds down near the horizon are very far away. This is actually an algorithm built into our brain. And, and the brain assumes that the sky is flat without really knowing it. Your emotions, your machine language of your brain tells you the sky is flat. And so anything down here, whether there's something to compare it to or not, or it's a flat horizon, it's going to look very big because your brain is used to seeing, assuming that the horizon's very far away. But things right overhead are very close. So it gives you the feeling that the moon overhead is teeny small and the full moon is on the horizon. It looks gigando. Oh, that's an interesting observation, Jerry. I've never heard that one. Okay. But it's an illusion, right? Totally. Yes. It's an optical illusion. Yeah, it's just an assumption you make, okay. your brain makes. Your brain has a lot of, that That book, um, Homo Deus, says that we are basically uh, an algorithm. And that's one of the algorithms we've evolved to have. So well, this, this shows the moon, oops, when it's full this Wednesday, I think it is. Yep. 30th. Yep. This is the southern horizon. And because the moon is, the ecliptic is so low on the horizon, the moon is not going to be directly overhead. So it's going to be less interfering with observations. But this is as high as it's going to get above the horizon when it's full. So and it, is, it is going to be closer, isn't it? Closer to the horizon? Right. Yeah. But what that, what I was talking about before is when the moon rises. Here the moon is going to rise. That's what's going to set over there. Here's here's the, the east. This is going to rise over here. So over here is where it would look big. And when it's up high, it's going to look smaller. So I'm talking about perigee. Oh, yes. It's going to be a super moon. Yes, that's true. So it is closer in its orbit to us. And that makes it a little bigger. I don't know if we can tell, but. No, no. It's you, only what, 200? Not by, not by looking because you don't have anything compared to it. But if you have a, a eyepiece with a reticle and a little ruler carved in it, you can measure at that power. You can measure the moon this month and the next month, and you can see that it, it grows and shrinks. Well, can we tease the folks about, if we're going to go into this subject later on, like in a future program, what they've found on the other side of the moon that we don't see, or the Chinese land, and something about a little thicker crust, perhaps? Yeah, we're going to, we can cover that in a minute or two. Well, right now, okay. These are the full moons. These are the full moons of this year, and here we are. August, uh, we get um, we get two moons. The typically the, the the August moon is a sturgeon moon, but the the second blue moon is just a blue moon. It doesn't get a name by itself. <laughs> the sturgeon moon. September sturgeon to get moon. Harvest moon. You where did they come up with these names? These are historic, um, and they differ with culture. Okay. Uh, in England, they probably call them other things. I don't know. Uh, Chuck, that's a uh, Chuck has a lot of uh, thing, yeah. information on that. 
Well, now we, get is, we do we get 13 full moons a year? Yeah, we only we can. have we're, we're, we're going to this year. Okay. Oh, we some years we only get 12 because we have only 12 three, months. Four, I'm five, wondering. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah. Do you suppose there's a culture? 13 full where, moons. You suppose there's a culture that has 28 day months? Not 30s and 31s? They have defined months and weeks uh, uh, differently all around the globe through different historic time frames. Okay. So, so uh, that 13th one is Ophiuchus moon, isn't it? Or Ophiuchus uh, house on the zodiac? Um, no, I don't think that's a name. The people used to tell time, especially farmers. They used to tell time of the year by the full moon. And that's where a lot of these names came from. Okay. 28 days, 13 full moons. The blue moon. There's a couple of songs about that. What's yeah. this? This is a picture, uh, an artist illustration. There's a lot of modeling going on because the current theory about where the moon came from is that a planet about this size relative to Earth hit the Earth off center. This is Theia, and this is the proto-Earth. And it blew all this crap off, which made a big ring around the Earth. And then um, um, the ring coalesced into what we what is now our present moon. <clears throat> so, but the um, the modeling it has some it, it's the most popular view of where the moon came from. It fits a lot of the data, but there's still some key data that it doesn't fit. And so they're continuing to model it, and the modeling. Um, basically says that 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 is um, looking promising at this time is that when Theia hit the Earth, it produced a ring of matter, but acceptable physical solutions to that math are. Um, hang on, I gotta close the door. So, wow, and it didn't get hit. It didn't get, 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 get hit direct. It got hit in an angle. So it got, this is not the Earth being hit by Theia. This, at one point, we had two moons, or maybe three, because when that thing formed, um, our moon from Theia, that ring um, produced, could have produced multiple moons uh, easily in addition, or, or one moon, either one, either solution works. And, but there, the fact is that their dates don't line up with the moon being created by the Theia time frame, because some of the material on the moon um, was created hundreds of millions of years later by a collision. So they're 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 working on the theory that the Theia hit produced two moons, and then these are their modeling of one moon hitting the other moon. This is hours after after this is zero hour. This is. Um, six tenths of an hour later, 1.4 hours later, and 2.8 hours. And the reason for this is because an off-center hit of the moon would take the crust of the moon after the moon had um, differentiated. So it's heavier elements, which it doesn't have a lot of, had formed a core. But this one would hit and it would knock a large portion of the surface of the moon around to the other side. And that's consistent with the moon's composition today. A single moon created, they can't make the composition fit. So the, the current theory being modeled, um, and it accounts for more of the information, is that the Theia hit produced several moons. And then over 100 million years or so, these moons collided and distorted each other and produced what we have today. Oh, that's interesting. Which is a little more on the other side that we don't see. Yeah. Uh -huh. the, crust is, the crust is much thicker on the other side. It's 30 miles thick and it's smaller on this side. I wonder That's if these, really interesting. I've heard the single, I've heard their single uh, moon theory, but that one yeah. is really nice. And there's this theory that somebody sent a canister into its eye and green yeah. cheese everywhere on the pizza. <laughs> well, I tell everybody at Outreach, if they go to the internet and they look and they Google the big splat, they will Thanks. see these theories of the moon being hit by Theia and stuff. But actually what you get is this picture. <laughs> yeah, you title it the big wax followed by the big splat. And there you go. Yeah, the big whack was when Theia hit and the big splat was when the two moons hit. 
Oh man, this is fascinating. We got to talk about this again, gentlemen. We have gone over time, but that's all right. A little embarrassment of riches. I'd As like to yeah. get ready for uh, Dr. Callis. John Callis is going to come talk about the loneliness of a dark universe this Friday night at Fleischmann Auditorium up at our beautiful Museum of Natural History. Get there by seven for the half hour planetarium show and then the program follows immediately and uh, we'd love to have you join us and tell your friends about our little podcast here and watch the workshop on tuesday nights with some of the gentlemen tim and jerry tom bruce thank you very much give my love to your wives and we'll see you hopefully friday